It's the real news. I'm Aaron Maté. President Trump has added a new entry to his roster of insult nicknames. On Twitter today, Trump called Senator Dianne Feinstein, quote, sneaky Diane, over her, over her decision to release the Senate testimony of Fusion GPS founder Glenn Simpson. Fusion GPS is the firm that paid for the infamous Steele dossier, which, among many things, accuses Trump and Russia of colluding to win the 2016 election. Well, at a news conference today, Trump continued to deny the collusion claims, and he also refused to say whether he would agree to an interview with the special counsel investigating them, Robert Mueller. Well, I will say this. Uh, there is collusion, but it's really with the Democrats and the Russians far more than it is with the Republicans and the Russians. So the witch hunt continues. But it has been determined that there is no collusion, and by virtually everybody, so we'll see what happens. But again, would you, would you be open to it? We'll see what happens. I mean, certainly I'll see what happens. But uh, when they have no collusion, and nobody's found any collusion at any level, uh, it seems unlikely that you'd even have an interview. Joining me is Marcy Wheeler, independent journalist who covers national security and civil liberties at her blog, MT Wheel. Marcy, welcome. Before we get to the, uh, tr the the dossier and the testimony that was released yesterday of Glenn Simpson, your thoughts on what we heard from President Trump today. Uh, his lawyers had indicated he would be open to an interview with Robert Mueller, but Trump today in his news conference appeared to uh, close the door on that slightly. Right. Um, remember that uh, especially the House Intelligence Committee is rushing to finish their alleged investigation. It's not really an investigation uh, and give him a clean bill of health. And I sort of suspect that once that happens, he's going to say, I've been deemed innocent and therefore I don't have to cooperate with Mueller. Um, we'll see whether that works. I don't think that'll work, but they're going to try it. So did you take what he said today to mean that he might not be uh, willing to uh, agree to the interview with Mueller that his lawyers had said he probably would? Yeah, it sounds like he's trying to find a way out of it. And as I suggested, I think if if HIPSI, if the House Intelligence Committee comes out next week and says no collusion, Trump will say no collusion and therefore I don't have to do an interview with Robert Mueller. I don't know if that's going to fly, but that seems to be what they've been working. So remember, Aaron, that um, Mueller's, Mueller first approached Trump's lawyers before Christmas about doing this interview. And since then, it's been nonstop Devin Nunes kind of propaganda to try and spin this stuff and Mueller and so on and so forth. Um, and so those seem connected. If they're connected, it seems like Nunes is trying to run interference for Trump so as to give him a quote unquote clean bill of health uh, as an excuse to not have to interview with Mueller. Because I don't see how he can get through a Mueller interview. I really don't. I mean, even. Even about, say, ducks on a pond, I don't think he could get through an interview where he was legally required to tell the truth, but especially not about this Russia stuff. Right. Well, I guess we'll see. Uh, time will tell. But meanwhile, now we have uh, this new testimony from Glenn Simpson, the founder of Fusion GPS, uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein going ahead and uh, unilaterally releasing it on her own. Uh, because uh, uh, Senator Chuck Grassley, the Republican, had refused to allow its release. Now, Marcy, you're in an interesting position because you think that there is something to its collusion story, but yet you've been skeptical for a long time. Yeah, the conspiracy, well, story, not the collusion story, but anyway, go ahead. Okay, yes, th this coordination story, whatever you okay. want to call it. But okay. you've been skeptical uh, for a long time about Democrats uh, adducing the Steele dossier to prove it. So now that you've read uh, Simpson's testimony yesterday, uh, the, again, the founder of the firm that was behind the Steele dossier, your thoughts on its content? I don't think it changes my opinion of the dossier. I don't think, uh, I don't think Simpson's testimony helps Democrats in the way they think it does. I will write up some questions I have that I get from the Simpson, the, the Simpson transcript. The same questions are there, right? Uh, he actually did this interview in August, and at that point, he was kind of ridiculously claiming that his Republican and Democratic funders, so remember first um, 
Um, Peter Singer funded a Republican dossier on Trump. And that, that, by the way, Aaron, sounds far more interesting than the one that Steele released. It, it focuses much more on Trump's mob ties. And then as Trump became the general election candidate, Hillary's people picked it up through their law firm, Perkins Coy. St Singer didn't use a law firm as, as a cutout in the way that the Democrats did. And nevertheless, Simpson refused to describe who his customer, who his client was, uh, citing privilege. There, there should be no privilege if you're working for a media outlet, uh, the, the Washington Free Beacon. So that's bizarre. And then even more bizarre is that Simpson was very willing to give details about his work for Prevazon, which is a big Russian, you know, oligarch uh, that is suing Bill Browder, which is really privileged. So that's where some of my questions begin with. And, and given the other things he hid, like some of the dates, but not the other dates, um, none of my questions have been answered. New ones, I think, have been arise. I, I, I won't say none of them have been answered. He did provide some really valuable uh, input about how um, the dossier was written, about uh, whether Steele worked with other people on what we have seen from the dossier. So that was useful, but I don't think it really helps the larger narrative about how the dossier relates to larger FBI investigation. And just to explain for anyone who's not familiar with the uh, large cast of characters that is uh, the Russiagate entails. So Bill Browder is this uh, very wealthy uh, hedge fund owner who was kicked out of Russia. Uh, he spurred the Magnitsky Act, uh, which were sanctions on Russia and um, which uh, so a, a Russian lawyer tried to lobby the Trump campaign, she says, to lift during the campaign, which was they say the subject of that infamous June 2016 Trump Tower meeting. So all different kinds of, and, and interestingly, so Fusion GPS, which paid for the steel dossier, also was employed by the Russian uh, company Provozone, who was going after uh, Bill Browder. So Fusion was playing many sides here, it, it turns out. But let me share with you, Marcy, the questions I have from uh, Simpson's testimony. He says that the FBI told him, uh, that the FBI told Christopher Steele at a uh, September 2016 meeting, that the concerns he was raising, because he first met with them in early July 2016. So Steele, according to Simpson, Steele says the FBI told him that the concerns he was raising about Trump-Russia collusion were tracking with a human source that the FBI had within the Trump organization. So my question there is, why would the FBI tell a private British citizen of a human source inside a campaign that they were still at that time actively investigating? I actually don't think they did. I think that, and, and Simpson kind of backed off the language of that later in his testimony. He said something like, uh, in response to a question very like yours, he said, well, I didn't actually say that. And uh, I think probably what happened is that Steele, in speaking with the FBI, interpreted something they said. He reported it back to Simpson. I suspect that there's more, I mean, let me take a step back. There has been independent reporting, multiple people saying that that reference is actually a reference to the story that came out recently of George Papadopoulos getting drunk, telling the Australian ambassador to the UK about having heard about these emails. Um, I suspect there's more to that story. The current story is that the ambassador didn't tell the United States right away waited until the emails started coming out from WikiLeaks, and only then did the ambassador to the United States, the Australian ambassador to the United States, go to the FBI and say, here's what that was about. So uh, we don't know all of that story, I'm convinced yet. But I think that what happened was Steele interpreted something he heard from the FBI and then went back in a game of telephone and told Simpson something else, and that's why we get the human source thing. Right. And to me, though, uh, this um, adds credence to the suspicion that it was, in fact, despite what Democrats say, it was, in fact, uh, Steele who kicked off the FBI investigation. Because, as you say, uh, the Australians told the U.S. about what George Papadopoulos allegedly said drunkenly about being told of hacked emails. And George Papadopoulos, by the way, for those who don't know, was a low-level Trump campaign aide. Um, so Papadopoulos... Uh, so the Australians reportedly told this to uh, the U.S. government, as you say, in late July after the emails were released. But Steele met with the FBI back in early July. So 
that's a long window in between. And to me, it makes it unlikely that it was, in, in fact, this, in, this uh, claim from the Australians that kickstarted the investigation. Anyway, I don't know, Marcy, if you have thoughts on that. Well, no, I, you know, I think that you're right that the Simpson transcript actually doesn't help Democrats as much as they, as much as they claim. Um, Steele brought the first report, which has proven to be inaccurate, contrary to what every Steele, what every dossier defender says. He brought that first report uh, with the P tape allegation in it to the FBI in the first week of July, 2016. According to the public story, the Australians did not inform the FBI about Papadopoulos' drunken ramblings until after it would be July 22nd. That's when WikiLeaks started releasing the emails. And so according, and according to Comey, the investigation was opened in late July. So both may have been predicates for the investigation, as well as the actual hack as well as there was a report that came into the CIA, there was a report that came in from another European government that I've heard about. So all of those things may have contributed to the, to the counterintelligence investigation. Plus, you know, uh, um, the Carter Page trip was early July. There were already rumblings about Manafort. All of those things, is my guess, went into opening the investigation after the emails started coming out in July, which would track with when Comey said that that was open. Incidentally, something that people often forget, Aaron, is that um, there are reports that the CIA opened a separate task force in June, based off some of their own reporting, which was compartmented from the CIA investigation, the counterintelligence investigation. So um, there's a lot that came in. I agree with you that uh, the Simpson do do the Simpson transcript doesn't help. Democrats as much as they would like. But the case is, is, in fact, real, that there were a lot of things we know that were floating around in July before the late July, according to Jim Comey, opening of that CIA investigation. Okay. And so just to explain uh, another character who emerged there, uh, in your words, Carter Page was a, another low-level uh, Trump aide who went to Russia, uh, apparently uh, helped spark some uh, scrutiny of the Trump campaign. Uh, and Russia. By the way, the Steele dossier claims that Carter Page was offered a 19% stake in the Russian state-owned oil company, uh, which is valued at something like $58 billion. So I don't know, he was offered something like an $11 billion stake if he could help get Trump to lift sanctions on Russia, which is, uh, I think, a curious claim, especially if you've seen Carter Page in, in interviews. But finally, Marcy, so in, in terms of the case, if you, uh, you don't by the Steele dossier and all of its uh, wild claims. What then is your theory of the case? Because now we're going on over a year since the uh, intelligence report came out alleging a, a Russian uh, influence operation attempt to elect Donald Trump, but still in terms of concrete evidence of collusion, despite all the leaked uh, phone calls and contacts, there's still nothing concrete that points to Trump, the Trump campaign and Russia colluding together to win this election. So so what then, if you could sum up for us, is your theory of the case? Well, I refuse to use the word collusion, no matter how many times you throw it at me. <laughs> um, it's very clear th that um, the Trump people heard about emails before the Democrats even heard about emails. It is also clear, I think, that the current story we have of that June 9th, 2016 meeting is a limited hangout. Um, I raised questions over the weekend about whether uh, two of the Russians left and two stayed around, or one Russian and, and one Brit. But uh, Marcy, just to explain, Marcy, just to explain, this is the meeting in Trump Tower between the Russian lawyer Veselinskaya, Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and Manafort, and a guy named Ike Kavaladze, who works for uh, a, a Russian oligarch who has long ties with Trump and has long you know, tried to set up business with Trump. And that's what I think is actually important about that meeting, not the vessel, the vessel it's, I can't say it, vessel it's Gaia. And, and so, as I said, that's a limited hangout. We do not know the full story of that meeting yet. Uh, there was a story over the weekend about Mueller bringing people back in to find out, I think, when people left the meeting and who they left it with and whether they all left together, which says um, the stories that we have aren't the full story. And, and, uh, um, and then I think that 
there are policy issues that you can point to and moments that you can point to that seem to be signaling to the Russians in this kind of dance back and forth towards policy concessions for help on the election. Um, and then like what? afterwards- Like what, Marcy? Marcy, like, like what? Like sanctions relief and uh, leaving Assad in power in Syria, both of which we've got evidence of, um, and both of which- Yes, except, except I have to say about Assad, I think it's quite likely Obama would have done the exact same thing because that was a losing battle. The US was not gonna put in the resources necessary to overthrow Assad. So I think no matter who was gonna come into power, that would have happened anyway. Um, whatever. I, I let me just say that we will let me just say that I am confident we will find information that supports a case that uh, Trump and the Russians made certain policy concessions and it was a back and forth iterative process all along the way that took place against the background of these emails being released and a number of other interventions by the Russians. That is my case of the But who made the, the uh, who would have made the context? Like who would have actually uh, who would have actually made the communication to discuss that between the two sides? Because as far as we know, that certainly has not come out yet. Well, no, I just spent 10 minutes explaining that the story we have of uh, the Trump Tower meeting is not the complete story of the Trump Tower meeting. And I, I say that with great confidence. And and there are a number of other parts of the story that we don't have the full story publicly yet either. Um, but But I think that you... You know, you've called both Page and Papadopoulos low-level people. They were nevertheless brokering, you know, Papadopoulos brokered a meeting with Sissy and Trump. So they were having a fairly large role in the campaign. And this is well before you get into what Manafort was doing, what Don, Don Jr. had this weird meeting in Paris in, I think, September, um, funded by pro Russian Syrians. So there's a lot of things like that. I, you know, I think Don Jr. was right in the thick of things. Um, that's where it's going to go. Well, here's what I can also tell you about George Papadopoulos, at least, uh, which is that we know that he lied to the campaign in telling them that he met with the uh, Russian ambassador to London. That's in his indictment. We also know that when he went to Greece, when he went to Greece, he also lied to Greek officials about his level of uh, seniority. In the Trump campaign, uh, as illustrated by the fact that after Trump came into office, George P. didn't even get a job there. So he doesn't seem to be that high placed if he couldn't even land a job in the campaign that he worked for. Sure. And those are the people who, I mean, the people who didn't land a job and the people who got fired are the ones who are providing a bunch of dirt right now to Mueller. All right. Well, on that note, we'll leave it there. Uh, and we'll, uh, I look forward to our next encounter, Marcy Wheeler, independent <laughs> journalist covers national security and civil liberties at her blog, mtwheel.net. Marcy, thank you. Good to talk to you, Aaron. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.